I'm sitting in a huge Catholic church in New York City, fidgeting next to my mother. I'm a 10-year-old tennis player staring up at a statue. Mom, why is that saint holding two tennis balls? I whisper. Those aren't tennis balls, Stephen. Those are her eyes. That's St. Lucy. She's the patron saint of vision. Fast forward nearly 40 years, and I had almost forgotten this until one morning walking into my laser suite. This little lady from Santa Fe stopped me, looked me directly in the eye, and slipped a tiny figure into my hand. Do a good job, young man, she said to me. I prayed for you last night, and I prayed to St. Lucy too. I still have that statue on my laser today. I've been studying and operating on this tiny organ my entire professional life. It's amazing, really. Half of your brain is devoted to vision-related activity, and 90% of all information going to your brain comes through your eyes. And it's the only organ that you can consciously turn on and off. Try this with me. Look directly at me. Now close your eyes. Now open them. You just hit the on-off switch. Try that with your kidneys. <laughs> but processing information and seeing clearly are two entirely different stories. The concept to use a laser to change vision was first described by Dr. Steve Trokel, a professor at New York's Columbia University and dear friend. He also happens to be the one who encouraged me to leave New York and move to a place at high altitude, like New Mexico, if LASIK was what I wanted to pursue. You see, at sea level, contact lenses are generally pretty comfortable. But the higher you go in altitude, they can become less so, motivating some people to seek a different way to correct their vision. Years ago, in fact, I had a patient whose first trip to Mount Everest was cut short due to a contact lens issue at the base camp. Years later, after LASIK, she returned and conquered the summit. So the geography of New Mexico has played a big role in my career, but I was in no way prepared for the role it would play in fundamentally changing the way that LASIK is performed. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's first look back. Imagine a person who, because of the shape of their eye, can't see in the distance. They can only see up close. This person, if they were born before the year 1450, they either A, didn't stray too far from their village, or B, were revered in their village for their ability to do detailed near work, like making engravings or transcripts. The same person born after the year 1450, if they lived in Germany, would have access to some rudimentary eyeglasses so they could move around a bit. In 1800, a person living in England who had astigmatism could have that corrected too. Then, in 1888, contact lenses became part of the discussion. First glass ones, and then in 1936, soft plastic contact lenses. So you can see external traditional ways to correct vision have been around for nearly six centuries. But now, we're in the era of lasers. We have laser light shows. We have laser scanners in stores. We have every branch of the military uses some form of laser on their aircraft. But how does a laser change vision? Well, let's start with an analogy. Have you ever seen those before and after pictures of that somewhat out of shape guy on January 1st who's determined to go to the gym and get his ideal shape in three months? Well, that's what lasers do, only a lot faster. They give the cornea the ideal shape so that when light enters the eye, it's focused on the retina where it should be. But that's actually only half the story. Most people are fascinated by this aspect of LASIK because, well, it's a laser. However, the biggest advances have been in the instruments we use before ever stepping foot in a laser suite. One such instrument, 
a wavefront aberrometer was developed right here at our national laboratories. It has fundamentally changed the way that LASIK works. It gives us a detailed roadmap telling a laser exactly what to do. I've been involved with FDA studies in each iteration of this software since 2002. It's used not only here, but also in Europe, in Japan, and in fact around the world. To best understand how this instrument works, let's go back and look at the way that vision was first described. Now, we could all agree that when we look at an object, the path of light comes from the object and into our eye. However, this understanding was really not always the case. In the fourth century BC, Plato put forth the emission theory of vision. The belief that light actually originated in our eye and was projected outward. Everyone believed this. Everyone believed that wherever we looked, light came out of our eye and lit up an object. It was advanced by all the best thinkers in the world until the 11th century AD when Al Hazen, the father of modern optics living in what is now Basra, Iraq, and perhaps the greatest mind to ever study the eye, who showed with a diagram that light actually came into the eye, not the other way around. This reversal of understanding was no less profound than perhaps the second greatest news story of all time, the fact that the world was in fact round, not flat. But in fact, the best way to change vision is to duplicate the way that Plato first thought the eye worked. We shine an invisible light into the back of the eye and reflect it off the retina. The emerging light rays are then captured by the wavefront aberrometer. Thousands of tiny mirrors then create the perfect wavefront and the laser puts this ideal shape on the cornea. It's 25 times more accurate than current ways we use to determine a prescription. And the backstory to how it was developed is fascinating. Years ago, scientists, in an effort to avoid some of the optical pitfalls that nearly doomed the Hubble Space Telescope, reached out to New Mexico's Dan Neal to fine tune the mirrors on its successor, the James Webb Telescope, set to launch in 2021. So research that was initially aimed at sharpening images coming from outer space evolved into the elegant instrument that I have in my office today. It has helped usher in the modern era of LASIK and it has helped me determine who should and perhaps more importantly, who shouldn't have LASIK. The impact of this approach cannot be overstated. Years ago, as a young flight surgeon in the Army, if one of my Apache helicopter pilots had a change in vision, I would have to pull them off flight status. Now, the military offers these pilots LASIK. And in the lead up to the Sochi Winter Olympics, a panel of non-doctor experts included modern LASIK in the list of advantages that American athletes have over their international competitors that also included superior nutrition, superior coaching, and training facilities. Why is this important? Well, by the year 2050, scientists predict that nearly half the world's population will be nearsighted, almost 5 billion people. This is due in part to an increasing Asian population and also to the fact that we do a lot more work up close on computers and handheld devices. In addition, there's the environmental impacts and the heightened scrutiny of single-use plastics. Last year alone, in the UK, 750 million contact lenses were disposed of, prompting some doctors to actually have recycle bin options for their patients. So it's possible that future innovations in LASIK could directly affect these numbers. It's also possible that these innovations can come from right here, perhaps our national laboratories, and directly impact the way that we see in the future. Let's all channel St. Lucie and make this happen.